Okay, we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pete Canlon. I'm the Executive Director at the American Creative Association. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our webinar tonight. I'm joined tonight by Mac Haddo, who is the Senior Fellow on Public Policy at the AKA. And we're also uh, very pleased and honored to have uh, David Carlucci, who's uh, joining us, a former uh, New York State Senator, and now helping us in several states uh, in uh, across the country in helping advance forward uh, positive Kratom legislation. So Mac and David, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Tonight, we're going to talk about a couple of key issues that are facing uh, the, the, the fight to protect Kratom. One, we're going to talk about the, the newly released or updated or reposted re FDA import alert. And Mac's going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, about what that actually means, were there any differences, and how that impacts us uh, moving forward in this fight to protect Kratom. We're also going to talk about advocacy and, and how all of you can be effective Kratom advocates. I know we've got some experts on the line. I see the folks who have joined us. Uh, many of you are, are fantastic advocates for Kratom. But we're going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing uh, from a legislative perspective on how you can help us uh, in that effort. Mac has been, and David, have both been traveling around the country, meeting with legislators, talking about Kratom. Uh, it's a very unusual year, the year after we have, we've had this pandemic, which has created several challenges for us. But I think both of them provide very unique and, and um, helpful insights on what you can do to help uh, our cause to, to keep Kratom legal. At the end, we will open this up for question and answer. We do have a, a Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, even just throughout the call, please feel free to uh, put those questions in there and we'll either address them as we, we go or we'll open it up at the end for question and answer. I did wanna make everyone aware of a program that we started very recently. Uh, it's called the Kratom, uh, I'm sorry, the Kratom uh, Consumer Council, sorry. Uh, the KCC, Kratom Consumer Council, which is a grassroots organization of volunteers who are willing to help spread their testimony about Kratom. Each state has a chapter and each uh, chapter has a state chair. And then each congressional district within that chapter, within that state, has what we call a congressional district captain. Uh, and they're really our feet on the ground. They're that front line of sharing with legislators uh, their testimony about Kratom. There's nothing more powerful. We're gonna hear a little bit about this from, from David uh, later. There's nothing more powerful than an elected official to hear directly from one of their constituents uh, about an issue. And, and that's why we're asking folks, if you haven't uh, done so already, to please join us in this Kratom Consumer Council. Uh, be that representative, be that person on the ground that can reach out to uh, their elected officials. And Matt's gonna talk a little bit more about this later, about how you can get more involved. So if you are interested in joining this, uh, we have over 490 members currently have signed up, but we need more. If you are interested in joining, please send me an email. Uh, my email address is pete.canland at americancratum.org. Uh, and when we send out a copy of this recording, I'll include that email address uh, in that email. But we, we are just very grateful for all the support you all have given us. We could not do this without your help. Uh, this organization runs 100% off the donation, uh, donations of folks like you. And we're very, very appreciative and work hard every day to honor those donations that you give us. So without any further delay, Mac, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you can uh, bring us up to speed on what we've seen with this uh, FDA, uh, FDA import alert, Mac. Uh, thanks, Pete. And, and I'm very grateful to uh, be sharing the, this panel tonight with uh, former Senator Carlucci. He's a friend of the Kratom community. Uh, he is knowledgeable and a great advocate for us and is leading up in some very important states that we have with the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. So David, welcome. And I think you'll find that the advocacy community is gonna be very grateful for your engagement with us uh, today. Uh, and I wanna talk about the import alert because that's the hot issue. Uh, everyone saw that the uh, FDA reaffirmed its import alert this past week. And, and what that means, by the way, is that they are restating their commitment to try to ban Kratom. No one should be any, under any illusion that the FDA's game is anything but uh, trying to, to make sure that they can enact the ban either directly using the pathway prescribed by the Controlled Substances Act 
Uh, and that, of course, has been, at least from, from the uh, perspective of science and policy, has been blocked uh, by the Assistant Secretary for Health's letter, indicating that emerging science has contradicted the FDA's position on the pharmacology of Kratom. And the science data is now disputed by reputable scientists about whether the FDA's position was ever valid. And of course, we know that it was not. But the FDA is going to keep that pathway open as best they can. They will do that by trying to challenge all new science. They will do everything they can to undermine the legitimate science that is emerging and the safety data that is now a part of the public discourse uh, that the Assistant Secretary for Health referenced. So everyone, everyone should understand that the FDA remains as committed today as they were on August the 31st of 2016 when they convinced the DEA to publish the Federal Register notice that put Kratom on the Federal Controlled Substances list uh, under the emergency power section. And then subsequently after failing in that effort, uh, they have uh, re reinitiated that uh, request uh, with a uh, eight factor analysis that was submitted to HHS and then transmitted to DEA for scheduling on October 17th of 2017. It was only when the Assistant Secretary for Health took the unprecedented action, never had a, a scheduling recommendation rescinded prior to that time because the Assistant Secretary for Health looked at the science, looked at the, at the safety data and concluded that the FDA was wrong. But the FDA doesn't accept that. And the best evidence of that is the statement that the FDA made about the import alert. They said two important things. One is they claimed that they were, they were republishing the import alert because they routinely will do that to update the specific information about vendors that are included in the import alert that are on what they call the red list. Now that's interesting because with Kratom, there are some individual vendors that are named, but the import alert applies to all Kratom raw materials. So they were reaffirming their commitment to try to stop the importation of Kratom raw materials into the United States using the import alert. Make no mistake, the FDA is hell bent in order to block all Kratom imports. And I'll talk more about that in a second. The second thing that the FDA said when asked by reporters about the significance of both the HHS rescission letter and the import alert, the statement was nothing has changed in the FDA's position on Kratom. Nothing has changed. It did not matter that the Assistant Secretary for Health determined that emerging science completely contradicted the FDA's position on the safety of Kratom for, with respect to the pharmacologic action. It didn't matter to the FDA. We knew that it didn't matter because the day after that letter was sent to the DEA withdrawing officially the, uh, the scheduling recommendation, the FDA <clears throat> insisted that it, that letter not be made public. And the day after, then Commissioner Scott Gottlieb went on a Twitter rant about Kratom, demonizing it once again, even though he knew that an independent review of the data that was used to support the original recommendation had been found to be insufficient by an independent trier of fact. The FDA doesn't care. So they're right. Nothing has changed in their position about Kratom. So remember what that means. Uh, I, I remember the days of 2016 when we fought this battle and it was a united effort. There was a community that was resolute in what they needed to get done to convince the, the, uh, the DEA that this was not a worthy effort, that the FDA was wrong on the science, wrong on the policy. And we united and fought that battle and we won. Uh, today, there are many in our community that believe we have won the battle. And if, if, if I could tell you we haven't, but listen to the FDA, nothing has changed about their position, which interpreted means they are gonna to continue to fight to, to uh, ban Kratom from sales. Here's how they do it. They are taking the position with the import alert that because all Kratom raw materials are either marketed by vendors as an unapproved new dietary ingredient. So the new dietary, dietary ingredient notification called the NDIN under the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act is an application made by a manufacturer saying, here is a dietary ingredient that I want, a dietary supplement I want to have approved. They have, the FDA has 75 days to say yay or nay as to whether or not they will object to it. Uh, 
Uh, if there's no objection, then that dietary supplement maker, a creative manufacturer, would be entitled to go on the marketplace. There have been, that we know of, at least five NDIN applications submitted to the FDA. We know that a couple of them probably were not sufficient with the evidence that's required under the NDIN to qualify. But we know, based on representations of experienced law firms and scientists who work to support those applications, that they were fully approvable by any standard that is applied by the FDA. And what the FDA has done is said, we, we object to, and then they list the deficiencies in the applications. And I should tell you that the applications, in order to be done right, cost anywhere from a half million to a million dollars in order to apply. So these companies that had done everything by the book, that had followed every FDA guideline, had matched the science and the requirements for the application, had fully complied, and then were told by the FDA in a sham that they did not qualify and therefore the objection was raised. When Dr. Henningfield and I were at the FDA for a public hearing, we happened to be standing in the hallway at, out in Bethesda at the FDA headquarters, and we encountered the, the individual that was then the deputy director of the Office of Dietary Supplements. And we challenged him on the fact that these, these NDIN applications were being routinely denied. And his answer to us was, they will continue to be denied until my boss, meaning at that time, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, were to green light them because they weren't going to evaluate the science. They weren't going to evaluate the merit of the application. They weren't going to look at the potential benefits that, that consumers would have of having access to a safe dietary supplement product formulated for which the structure function claims can be made once you get a dietary supplement through the regulatory process provided for under the Deshea Act. So clearly the FDA is not playing fair. Nothing has changed with the FDA's position, their words. Then of course you have the, the question about wh whether Kratom is being marketed by some vendors as a therapeutic agent that can help them in fighting disease. The FDA is completely correct that for Kratom that is marketed for that purpose, it is illegal. They are right to say, we will go in and shut down any vendor that makes impermissible health claims under the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act that are not allowed. They have the right to shut them down, put them out of business, seize their products. We have no objection to that, but they, what they cannot or should not be able to do is to use the import alert, which is not a part of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act for the purposes of evaluating the validity of any product or the safety of any product. It is about whether or not that raw material from a specific vendor, uh, from Indonesia in this case, has a contaminated or adulterated product, or that product is a finished Kratom product that is being marketed using structure function claims or therapeutic claims. That's the extent of the authority that's provided by the Congress by statute to the FDA. But the FDA has, has stretched their authority and they're claiming that because some vendors, and they claim all, so, you know, it's just the way they get, they get away with this, they claim creating vendors are marketing with impermissible health claims and with structured function claims. And therefore, Kratom is either an unapproved drug or a dietary supplement that hasn't been approved and that's why they, how they justify the import alerts. The truth is that the structure of the import alert law was designed to identify specific vendors. The FDA, and I know some people question the AKA about why we do this, Kratom is a food under the classification of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It is not a dietary supplement automatically. That requires additional testing and safety data to present to the FDA. It is not a drug unless a, a, an applicant, a vendor in this case, makes an application under the new, the new drug application procedure. But every other uh, product of Kratom is a food. And here's the kicker. The FDA has no pre-market approval on any food product. So it is impermissible for them to try to stop a Kratom raw material that is unadulterated and not contaminated from being imported by a broker into the United States because bulk Kratom raw materials are neither a food or, or neither, neither a dietary supplement or a drug. And they're not, they're not imported for any purpose other than as a food. And it's given that the FDA has no pre-market approval on foods, they, can, they should not be allowed to interdict them with a, an import alert. Now, 
once that Kratom raw material goes to a manufacturer, the manufacturer can be regulated by the FDA. In fact, all food products are. So the FDA can say that when you manufacture a Kratom product, you have to follow GMP guidelines, which means that there are good manufacturing uh, guidelines that are in place and vendors have to be compliant. It is as true for leafy vegetable products, lettuce, fruits, all of that are covered by GMP guidelines in the manufacturing of finished food products. Even if it's a head of lettuce, it still goes through GMP re regulations. So this is important for everyone to understand. Kratom in its raw form, it should not be subject to an import alert, but it is subject when it's manufactured into a finished product, all of the GMP guidelines that are required by the Food and Drug Administration. And if the FDA were doing their job properly, that's the way the system would work now. I hear lots of people say, I don't want any regulation. I hear the argument. I know the libertarian streak that all of us have is that we don't need the government interfering with the decisions that we make about the products that we're going to consume either to sustain us or for our health and well-being. That's a perfectly good argument. It is part of the constitutionally recognized free speech rights that we have as individuals to freely consume products without interference of the government, except for the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which does limit commercial speech. And if a vendor determines that they are going to abrogate the law by making uh, these structure function claims or therapeutic claims, or by not complying with the GMP regulations and the labeling requirements for foods, then the FDA has every right to stop the vendor. The choices we make as individuals cannot be interfered with by the government in that context. But if they're able, because vendors don't comply with the law, if they're able to stop the manufacturing of Kratom products, then we are denied access as consumers to those safe consumer products. So I hear the argument about people that say we should have no regulation. In fact, as, as many of you may have seen, there is a vocal critic uh, on the internet, it's called the Kratom Herald, where he has been castigating the FDA, the AKA for the past month or so, claiming that the Kratom Consumer Protection Act that we advocate for is an overreach of authority and it actually cooperates with the FDA, which is nonsense. And it also is in favors of the big Kratom manufacturers in order to squeeze out the small Kratom manufacturers. I can tell you if you're looking for a parallel example of how this market gets regulated, look back to the enactment of the Hatch-Waxman Act in 1984 that created the generic drug industry. This was landmark legislation that, that directly fought big pharma. And it allowed for the introduction of generic products going through an application process to demonstrate that they were equivalent to the brand name drug. And after the market exclusivity period had ended uh, for that pharma drug under the patent laws, that the generic drugs could then offer to consumers an equivalent product that was cheaper than the brand name product. It was revolutionary. But when that law first got passed, the generic drug industry sat down and they came to a couple of conclusions. One is the challenge that they would have is to make sure that they were regulated properly and they didn't want a generic drug manufacturer who at the time, there were many very small uh, generic drug manufacturers that literally, and this is a true story, were producing drugs in bathtubs in their homes uh, or they were doing it in their garages. Now, does that ring true for some of our Kratom vendors? We know that there are some small vendors who are producing Kratom products in their homes in, in, as a replacement for, a substitute for a manufacturing facility. Whether we like it or not, the FDA has the right to insist that good manufacturing practices be implemented in the manufacturing of a food product. That means that you have to comply with those GMP standards which includes making sure you have a clean environment by which those products are, are in any way formulated and packaged. I got one of the famous videos uh, back in 2017 of a, one of these small Kratom vendors who was telling me how careful he was. He sent me a video, he had a hairnet on, he had PPE on with the gown and he had gloves. And he was showing me how he was pouring the Kratom raw material into a Ziploc bag, which by the way is okay, it's not the best form, but you know, and then he sealed it and he put a label on it. And while he's doing this with his narrative on this video, I saw a cat walk behind him in the, on the bed that he was manufacturing his, his Kratom products. He was proud of the fact that he was able to do it sitting right there with his gloves and his hairnet and he had a cat in the room. 
that violates good GMP standards. And that product would be off the market and the FDA would have every right to do it because that's the, re the regulation, the, the statutory authority that Congress has granted to the FDA to protect the consuming public in America in food products. It's the law. And everyone who likes to say, well, the AKA is promoting this very hyper-regulatory scheme that only favors the big manufacturers, it's wrong facially. It is completely incorrect. The AK's position is that every competitive, and that's the important word, competitive trade and manufacturer that enters the marketplace and is willing to uh, actually follow GMP uh, uh, procedures should be allowed to be on the marketplace. And a robust, healthy, competitive marketplace comes down to being able to fight with small vendors against large ones in order to produce a safe product that's competitively priced. What we can't do is allow for those in the industry that are not following GMP practices, which means they do not invest in the equipment that's necessary or the facilities that are necessary to comply with FDA regulations about good manufacturing practices. So they, can, they, they have to make that investment cost money. They have to train their employees and keep adequate records. There have to be batch records. There have to be finished product records. You have to be able to uh, track back through a, a, a code exactly which batch of material was produced. That takes money to invest in those kinds of systems and the equipment that's necessary in order to do it. And then to maintain those records in a repository that is available to the FDA when there is a complaint issued or perhaps a, an infection that occurs because of a contaminant, they have to be able to track back and then be able to recall based on those lot numbers, all of those products cost money. So for those small vendors that say, I don't want to invest in any of that. I want to be able to sell my products cheap because I can get Kratom customers who will, who will flock to me because those big companies charge more. Well, those big companies have made the requisite investment that is required under the law in order to put a product into the marketplace so that you're assured of your safety. And for every one of those so-called small vendors, and I, I classify them differently, those non-compliant vendors, because there are plenty of small vendors that are able to invest and compete on price with the, in the creative marketplace with the big guys. But you, if you have these, these people at the bottom who refuse to comply and invest, then what they're doing is undermining the credibility of our industry. And the, 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 the decision that the generic drug industry came to was they had to clean themselves up. They went on a, a very specific program to clean out all of the non-compliant generic drug manufacturers in the United States because of one thing. They feared that there will be people die as a result of poor, poorly formulated or contaminated generic drug products that would enter the, the, uh, the marketplace and that would kill their industry. And by the way, it would have. Same is true today. We have, we have a target on our backs that the FDA has placed on us claiming that Kratom itself kills people. If they can trace back deaths that are related to poorly formulated or contaminated products, then we do ourselves in. And so to those people that are making the argument, specifically to the Kratom Herald, anyone who makes this nonsensical argument doesn't have the best interest of the Kratom consumer in mind. They have and are working on behalf of those in our industry who are trying to go around the rules, who are not willing to make the investment, that want to sell everything on the cheap. And by the way, I understand. Most consumers want to have as, as cost, a, a cost-effective product, right? You want to have a competitively priced product. But if that competitively priced product is derivative of a, a unsafe environment and they're, they're going around the rules, then that's not a competitive marketplace at all. That's an unfair marketplace. And so to those people, I would simply say you're wrong. Uh, now, I have invited the author of the Kratom Herald to talk. He, he refuses to speak with me, uh, but you know that just shows you how, how he is in a position now where he likes to spread his disinformation. He's aligned with the FDA when it comes to uh, the, spreading this disinformation campaign because he's just as wrong as the FDA is on these kinds of issues. And I would ask everyone to discount it. But more importantly, I would ask the Kratom consumer public to understand that a competitively priced marketplace relies first on the safety of the product that is manufactured, that is fully compliant with appropriate food regulations. And then we can have a rational discussion about who's taking or exploiting the marketplace. I can tell you the ones who are exploiting the marketplace the most today, and the thing that the Kratom Consumer Protection Act tries to guard against 
are those manufacturers who are deliberately adulterating pure Kratom products in order to spike sales. And they do it by adding just a little bit of fentanyl or morphine or heroin or buprenorphine in order to, uh, to elevate the experience. So when you take that Kratom product, you feel this euphoric high and it's reinforcing, it's addictive. It's because it's fentanyl and heroin and morphine. Uh, that if you get that, you know you got an adulterated product. Uh, and those vendors who are engaging in those kinds of practices are the ones who threaten the, the, the Kratom marketplace the most because that's where we're seeing the kind of data that allows the FDA to say that you have these, that all Kratom materials, it's so ubiquitous in the marketplace that all these Kratom products have to be restricted and a de facto ban is being imposed through the import alert that they can't get with the DEA that requires them to actually show science. All they have to do at the import alert is to tell a customs official Kratom is bad. It's unsafe. That's all they have to do. They don't have to prove, they don't prove anything to the customs uh, the bureau. All they do is say, we got an import alert and you can read those import alerts for yourself. There are two of them. Both of them rely upon unfair and, and, and unverified information about the marketing claims being made by some vendors, which the FDA, by the way, has statutory authority to block, or they, they simply make this broad claim that everything's an unapproved drug. It is true that Kratom does not have an approval as a drug. No one's asked to date. It is true that there is no approved dietary supplement use for a Kratom product, despite those that have asked and despite those who have, uh, who have actually uh, proven that they're, that they're actually safe products and ought to be approvable, it's the FDA that's in the way. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And to the extent that we buy into their game, where we get sucked into it and we allow for these bottom feeders who are not compliant in the, in the Kratom industry, we do ourselves in. So I encourage everyone to look for a couple of things. We encourage all of the Kratom consumers and the number one hit we get on our website is where can I buy a safe Kratom product? Start with those vendors who have voluntarily agreed to submit to the AKA GMP program that, uh, that they, they get an independent third party audit done verifying their compliance with the standards that are required by the FDA for the manufacturing of their products and that they comply with labeling. That's important. And so if you want a, a reduce the risk and promote the safe environment for Kratom products, look at the AK website and buy from those vendors that have qualified for uh, that designation as an approved vendor. That's important. We don't make any money on that at the AK. We're trying to provide a service to the, the Kratom consuming public in order to know where they can get safe products. That's an important thing for everyone to do. We also encourage that if you see a vendor that is making one of those claims, uh, that it's a, it, you know, it's helping me with my arthritis or it's relieving my pain, helping me get off of opioids. That is an impermissible health claim. It's illegal. And we ask you to report it to us. We have the truth and labeling program. We will evaluate that claim and, and the, the complaint. We will reach out to the vendor. It's possible the vendor doesn't know the law. We will tell them that they're out of compliance, give them a chance to come into compliance. But if they refuse, we report them. And we've reported dozens to the FDA at this point. We will continue that program because they are the ones who are killing this industry with these kinds of impermissible health claims. And they're all over the place. By the way, and this is an important point, they, they don't even have to be the one to make the claim. If the claim is made by a commenter, a Kratom consumer, who goes onto their website over which that vendor has complete control of the content and says, this has helped my fibromyalgia. This has helped me with my arthritis. This has helped reduce anxiety. This has helped me with my chronic pain. Those are all impermissible health claims that are banned by the FDA, by the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which the FDA is uh, entitled to enforce. And the fact that that vendor has control over the website or the blog post where those comments are made puts them in violation. That's the law. And that's true not just for Kratom. That's true for every product for which there is a therapeutic claim made. So the reality that we have is to be responsible, good citizens, both from the vendor community and with the Kratom consuming public. We have to be able to be willing to follow the law and to recognize and buy from those vendors who are willing to comply with it. And I make no apology for the strong position that we've taken at the AKA to weed out the industry from these bad actors because there's only one outcome we're interested in at the AKA, to maintain legal access by consumers to safe and unadulterated Kratom products. That's the bottom line. And we can argue all day long about whether or not 
the FDA should have this authority or not. That's an issue that we take up with the Congress. We can argue all, all day long about whether the FDA enforces the law appropriately or whether they single out Kratom vendors versus CBD vendors, for example. And that's, again, an issue that we can discuss with the Congress. But right now, we need to protect our industry. We need to protect consumers, and we're going to do it. So the import alert is ground zero for us right now, where the FDA is trying to implement a de facto ban on Kratom by stopping all Kratom imports into the United States. It has tremendous far-reaching impacts. It is true that today, the uh, Indonesian supply chain of Kratom is improving. So we're eliminating many of the very weaknesses and vulnerabilities that have existed in the Kratom supply chain up to now because we're seeing dramatic improvements over in Indonesia where we're actually now getting to the point we can trace the Kratom material back to a farm. That's important for supply chain verification that the FDA ultimately is going to require us to have in order to get off of the import alert, uh, even if we take the broad stroke of it. But all food products that are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration today have to be traceable back to the farm or the location source so that if there is an outbreak of salmonella or E. coli, they can go back and find it and stop it from being shipped and contaminating the raw material uh, containers that are being shipped into the United States. This is an important fact that we have to deal with. Also, the, uh, the, the processing that is being done, Indonesia is improving. There are some things that are hard to do. When you're out in the remote region in Indonesia, and those who have visited will know this, there is no uh, clean water that's available to wash the leaves before they lay them out to dry. So we get potentially contaminated water. We know that there are some areas of Indonesia in the growing regions that are volcanic, volcanic soils that will always produce a high metal, uh, heavy metal content in the Kratom product. When it gets too high, we need to identify and block those areas from producing Kratom products that ultimately end up in human consumption. We know that there have been problems where the farmers will not use sanitary uh, procedures and hygiene methods in order to dry the kratom leaves. And then when they're ground into powder, often they were using World War II era coffee grinding machines where literally the metal filings of the grinding gears were being dropped into the kratom product, which accounts for some of the lead and nickel content that the FDA determined was in the excess of the standards allowed for food products. So, We've, just, we've seen dramatic improvements there. I think there's a willingness by the Indonesian uh, community, uh, the growing community to fix these things. I've seen fabulous improvements. I just got videos from each one of the three major growing groups showing the kinds of equipment they're using food grade uh, stainless steel grinding machines. Uh, they're in, in clean rooms, they're packaging this material properly and most importantly, they're testing it. Now it's not perfect yet, but most of the big growers groups are now testing to make sure that there is not a, a uh, dangerously high level of E. coli, salmonella, or heavy metals. We will test here in the United States. And so that provides significant improvements uh, for the, uh, the Kratom community and protection for us as we go forward. Uh, the import alert will only go away if we can get the cooperation of the Indonesian government to help us with the FDA where they make the application for the, the import alert to be removed. This is similar to what happened with Indonesian shrimp uh, se several years ago, where there was a blanket ban put on all shrimp out of Indonesia. But it was a temporary ban because the Indonesian government in cooperation with the processors of shrimp went to the FDA and said, here's what we've done. We can prove that we have improved the processes for the processing of shrimp and its shipping and they were restored back to uh, full commodity status with the FTA. We're gonna need the Indonesian government to cooperate with us. And we know over in Indonesia, there is a war that's going on over Kratom, just like there is here between the FDA and the DEA and HHS and NIDA. Over there, it's the war between the BNN, which is the equivalent of the DEA. They would be more like the FDA here in the United States. You have BPOM, which is the Indonesian FDA, which has now opened up a good scientific review of Kratom. I think that they're learning and citing the very thing that the Assistant Secretary for Health talked about with emerging science, which is showing the safety of Kratom. Uh, they're seeing that at BPOM, the, the equivalent of the FDA. The Ministry of Agriculture took an important step, but then was forced to rescind it when he designated Kratom as an herbal medicine. 
That was important to avoid the ban with the, uh, that had been implemented by the BNN, which said that in 2024, all Kratom was banned completely from anyone growing it. Uh, and they tried to accelerate that ban into 2023. This remains a battle that's going on right now. And the Ministry of Agriculture is trying to help that they're being beaten silly by the BNN. Uh, we worked with the Ministry of Trade and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs over there and the Ministry of Finance, and we're trying to work out a solution. We expect that when the COVID uh, the, the, the restrictions are lifted, that our delegation will go and visit with the BNN and the Ministry of Agriculture there, hopefully in late May or early June. And we're gonna be able to start this process of negotiating with the Indonesian ministries to go to the FDA and be the applicant for the removal. And even if we have to do it on a test period for a couple of years to demonstrate that we can meet all of the supply chain requirements to maintain the safety and integrity of the Kratom raw material products that come into the United States. So that's our goal. Uh, be, until then, we're going to have to continue to fight this battle. We're going to have to fight on the legal case, the policy case, and we're going to have to resist what the FDA is trying to do to ban all Kratom coming into the United States. There's lots of hope for us in this battle because despite that battle that's going on over in Indonesia, uh, there is a recognition of a couple of important things in the Indonesian government. First, we've seen excellent reports from the office of the president, where the president himself, in a visit down to the growing region, made very positive statements about the importance of Kratom to the economic system in the growing regions, which are largely low-income families, and how important it was for Kratom to sustain that. Now, the BNN tried to sweep in and say, okay, we'll replace it with sewing machines and build a textile industry. That didn't work. Uh, they tried it and it, it failed because the, the families weren't interested in doing that. They've, for generations, have been harvesting Kratom, and they want to continue to do that. Uh, I was on a call that was organized by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce welcoming the incoming ambassador designate to the United States from Indonesia, and he will be here probably in June. And uh, I had the opportunity to ask the last question of this, uh, of this seminar that was the, the Zoom meeting was held. And by the way, there were, there were all the largest companies in the world, Boeing, Prudential, I mean, there were, there were a lot of heavy hitters. And, and through the good work of uh, Wayne Forrest, who runs the American Indonesian Chamber of Commerce, who's a real friend of the Kratom community, he arranged for us to have the opportunity to ask the question. And my question was simple. I asked the ambassador designate if he would help us in working with the FDA to, uh, to stop this war against Indonesian Kratom. And his answer astounded me in the depth of knowledge that he had, his complete affirmation that he wanted to work with the American Kratom Association because he recognized the significant economic impact that a ban would have on these uh, low-income families in the growing regions in Indonesia. It was a fabulous conversation. He made a commitment that we would be able to meet when he arrives here in June in the United States. We're looking forward to that meeting because it will be a positive step in order to further isolate the FDA in their battle against Kratom, in their war against Kratom. I shouldn't call it a battle. Uh, so we are today in a position where we're going to fight on the import alert. Uh, we are going to do everything we can in order to promote good public policy. Part of that is going to be to reassure the FDA that we're committed to self-regulation. We're committed to only the production of safe products uh, both that meet the supply chain requirements and the manufacturing requirements that meet GMP standards, and that those products that are completely safe, uncontaminated, and non-adulterated will be available to consumers in the marketplace. Until we get to that point, we will continue to fight in the states to get the Kratom Consumer Protection Act passed, despite the criticism from uh, groups like the Kratom Herald, which are wrong. And I emphasize to anyone that's listening to that nonsense, tell them they're wrong, because they are. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, the other the enemy that we have, other than the, among ourselves with groups like this, is the, the FDA who is aggressively out, even today, spreading their disinformation campaign in the states. We're active now in almost 30 states with the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. In every one of those states, I hear it time and time again, I just heard from the FDA today. They are out spreading their disinformation. They have the bully pulpit with many of these legislators who don't even know what Kratom is. And that's why the Kratom Consumer Council that Pete referenced earlier is critically important to us because as we continue to work with these legislators, they need to understand not just the science and the policy. They're not experts, they're, they're average, for the most part, they're not professional politicians. They're just average people 
And so they're trying to do the best they can with a myriad of issues that they have to deal with. And the, the thing that will tip the balance is a constituent of theirs calling them and telling them that Kratom has improved the quality of their lives or saved their lives. Uh, those messages are critically important and we'll transition now and, and I promise we'll get to Q and A's, but I'll, I'll turn it over to David who has been on the other side uh, in terms of being a legislator and let him describe to you what the kinds of experiences, what works in terms of your communicating with a member of the legislature uh, and how you can most effectively convey that, that message and how you introduce yourself and how you make your case uh, and all that. So I'll turn it over to David and thank you, David, again, for being with us because what an asset for us uh, in the Kratom community to have someone with your expertise and background uh, to become an advocate for us. So I'll turn it over to you to have this uh, conversation with our advocates. Well, Mac, thank you so much. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here and to be working with you and the entire community to get this legislation passed in the states and make sure that Kratom remains accessible and safe to the millions of people that consume it. And so as a, a former lawmaker, I just left office in January and I got introduced to Kratom through my work on the addiction task force in New York. And I kept hearing stories about Kratom. And that's what I think is so important that uh, Mac just went into great length about the details uh, on the national level, internationally, it sounds very complicated. And the thing that I wanna stress is that these things that we can do, I think the most powerful thing that we can all do, it's easy to do, it's easy not to do. But what the first thing to do is to make sure that your lawmakers know exactly how you feel. Um, I know as a Senator that represented about 300,000 people that yes, that's a lot of people, but the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And I really believe that it's emotion over logic, that many times it's that story. It's that emotional story that we're so blessed that we have so many consumers that are so passionate that articulating that and telling that story is essential. So what I recommend, it's not difficult. Pick up the phone and call your lawmaker, look it up and see who your state lawmakers are and make sure whether it's your state senator, your state assembly member, uh, your state representative, that they know uh, who you are and how you feel about Kratom and why it's important that they support the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. As I talk to lawmakers, I mean, I saw this in New York and I see it as I'm trying to pass the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. As I talk to lawmakers, almost all of them have never heard of Kratom. Uh, they, don't, they don't have any idea. And so when the issues that Mac has talked about, the FDA just mentions anything, um, it, it causes a whole bunch of confusion and they err on the side of doing nothing. And that's why when they hear from their constituents, uh, they want to be, they want to help. They want to please the, the people in their community. So just by doing that, by sharing your story. So what do you do? Call them. Uh, and if their assistant answers, leave a message and tell them, hey, I'd like uh, Senator Smith to know that I'm David Carlucci. I live here. And this, this is why Kratom is important to me. The other thing is to send them an email. In addition to that, to do letters to the editor, uh, any of your local publications to tell your story. And that's really the key that I always say that, you know, we, we have statistics and, and um, reports, but what really tells the story is you put a face on it, that someone is uh, human, just, just like them, sharing a story about how this, this product really is helping improve the quality of, of, of your life. So, you know, it, it's, not, um, it's not hard to do, you know, it's easy to do, but it's easy not to do. And sometimes we feel like, oh, well, what is my one voice? And I'll tell you, it's, it's really impactful. It's really meaningful. And if all of us that are on this call today, and I know many of you have, you've been so vocal, that you just really focus in on, even if you just focus in on your lawmakers right now and make that effort to call them, send them an email, and possibly have a meeting with them. Ask them if you can come in and meet with them. That Those are the keys that that is something that will really give us the momentum we need to get this legislation passed. 
Um, so with that, I, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions on that end um, and, and turn it over back over to, to Mac. Uh, thanks, David. And, and I'll add one more issue that I know it creates some uh, consternation in our community. And it's one that I'm sympathetic with, and that is the age limit issue. In a perfect world, there would be no age limit placed on the purchase of a, or acquisition of a Kratom product because there is no evidence, none, of any harm to a, a child or to a minor from the consumption of Kratom. But the FDA has made this their cause celeb in working with law enforcement officials. And as we work with local government officials and with state legislators, we hear it consistently that they do not want Kratom to be in the hands of minors because they buy into this theory that Kratom potentially uh, is, uh, is, is addictive. Uh, you can get the deny that. Uh, if you have an addictive personality, you can become addicted to it. The real issue is what's the solution after that? And we know that the, the withdrawal uh, exercise with Kratom is far less a problem than it is for an opioid or a dangerous drug. So uh, there's, a, there's a very robust discussion around that, but the FDA has targeted these law enforcement officials. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigations official and I got into, it would have been a fist fight, except we're on Zoom. And he was arguing that we were trying to, to uh, get all the kids addicted. And I made the argument to him that, you know, you're absolutely wrong because there's no data to support your position. But he didn't need it, any data. He just had to say it. It was inflammatory and it, it resonates with legislators. So the idea that we would accept a, uh, an age limitation on the uh, sale and possession of Kratom products is merely responsive to take away the argument that, the, uh, that the, the police have and that the FDA instigates about minors having access to it. And our argument is very simple. A parent should participate in the decision about whether or not their child uses a Kratom product. And, and, and we're done. And, and by the way, there's one safety factor, which it is real. And that is that if there is an, a, a contaminated or rather an adulterated Kratom product that has morphine or fentanyl or heroin in it, kids are gonna long to that. They're gonna jump on it. And they'll just by word of mouth, that'll become the hottest selling product in the area. Maybe that's a good way to identify the adulterants, but uh, that's a fair uh, issue. And this law prevents that uh, from even being on the marketplace. And then if they want their age limit, we live with it. We don't like it, but we live with it. And it's one of the concessions you have to make in the negotiations for legislation along the way. We have to sometimes make concessions to get the KCPA passed that we don't particularly like, but the, the greater good is to have it in place so that we can fight the FDA at the national level. So that's the, the, the bottom line on this. And, uh, and we apologize to though that are those of you who say, oh, there, there's absolutely no data to support this. Right, but we can, the, the difference is do we ban it or do we just put in a regulation that says you can as a minor acquire it? And, We'll live with the second rather than the former uh, any day of the week. So with that, we'll, we'll open up now to questions and answers that anyone has. And the way to do this, there's a Q&A section uh, down at the bottom. We'll let Pete be the monitor for this. If you want to ask a question, you can, uh, can raise your hand and Pete will recognize you and, uh, or someone who is handling that, and then we can uh, respond to it. All right, well, thank you, Mac. Thank you, David. I've got a few questions here that I've been able to gather that we can uh, go through here. And I know some of it will be repeating what you've already talked about, but I think it'd be good just to, in a concise way, uh, review the answer. Uh, how, and this is one of the questions that I get very often. How do you share your Kratom thoughts or your Kratom story in a state where Kratom is banned? So, you know, folks are worried that if they share that they're a consumer of Kratom or a supporter of Kratom, that somehow they're going to be a target because Kratom is banned in their state. So how can they share their support for Kratom in a state where it, it, is, it is banned? Yeah, Peter, what I would say to that is that it's extremely important that in, particularly in those states that you share your experience with the lawmakers uh, to tell them about why it was important to you, why it is important to you, and now the trouble that you're experiencing because of this ban. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to get into details about, you know, where you're getting it or consuming it. I think that what's important is that you share that story with your lawmaker to let them know how destructive and how, um, how, how big of a problem by having this ban in place is. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I would add to that uh, just some experiences we've had. In the state of Wisconsin, a banned state, there was a hearing that was held by the Senate Health Committee and the Kratom consumers packed that room. And it was interesting to hear their description. Most of them were technically at risk, right? No one was gonna be arresting them. That's the first deal. These legislators wanted to hear the policy implications of the ban, right? Uh, and it was, but it still took some courage for people to stand up there and testify. And it was wonderful to hear. And in the end, unanimous vote to open up a bill file to, uh, for the, the KCPA to replace the ban. And COVID shut us down, but we're back at it this year. So that's in a state that's banned. Now there's other states where you would be, you'd be dumb to get up there and say much publicly. Alabama's an example. That's one that we're gonna, it's a long-term project for us. We're gonna get, get it out of the way, we hope. There's strict enforcement in Arkansas, but I've been on the phone with the Speaker of the House and the Senate leadership over the last couple of days in Arkansas. And there's a real interest in unwinding that ban, basically because the only reason it was implemented in the first place is because a doctor in Arkansas reported to the Department of Health that the FDA had said that this was a dangerous opioid. And it's on, on the record. It's a part of the record for which they submitted the uh, ban bill that was approved by the, the Arkansas legislature. So. There's one that while it's very tough enforcement, uh, the policy I think is gonna be unwound here at the legislative level. But as David said, there's nothing wrong with you picking up the phone and explaining your personal experience with that legislator or a member of their staff in order to get your voice heard. And I think that's the key to do it. And uh, in Rhode Island, we see the same kind of testimony. We saw the testimony in Vermont. Uh, that's another banned state. We're making real progress in these states by educating these legislators and at some point, there'll be a reaction to this overregulation. And it's already been proven by the Assistant Secretary for Health. They can't ban it uh, federally. So they're coming to the states and they're, they, and they're giving disinformation to do it. So we're going to win this battle in the end. Thank you very much. Uh, one person asked, what do I do if a vendor is making impermissible claims uh, or, or, or using improper marketing techni techniques? I would just myself... Uh, let you know that you should send me an email. You can send me an email at pete.canlon at americankratom.org. Uh, we started, as, as Mac mentioned, the Truth and Labeling Program. And the Truth and Labeling Program is really meant to try to, for, the first step, educate vendors on what they should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, just, just today, actually, uh, I received a response back from one of the vendors that, that I had reached out to, letting them know about certain impermissible marketing techniques that they were doing on their website. Uh, they were very eager and appreciative to, to learn that they were doing, uh, what they were doing was, was incorrect. And they said that they were immediately going to take action to, to change it. I checked at their website uh, later this, uh, earlier this evening, and they had made those updates. So most folks out there are doing things uh, because they don't know any better, because they, they haven't been educated on what they should and shouldn't be doing. Some folks are out there for other reasons. Some folks are out there for shortcuts to try and um, sell more of their products. Some folks don't care about the Kratom consumer. And that's what we're trying to do. That's how we're trying to clean up the marketplace. Uh, if a vendor refuses to make those changes, uh, then they are referred to the FDA. Uh, so far, we have sent correspondence to the FDA to make them aware, because I, I think one of the biggest threats that we have to the legality of Kratom are, are vendors within the Kratom industry, uh, because there is nothing that will bring the ire of the, the DEA and the FDA quicker on, on the Kratom industry than if there are a series of, of deaths related to Kratom products. Uh, we, we saw it, Mac has, has always talked about the, the, the Krypton product, which was really that, that ground zero of how the FDA got Kratom on the radar, and we can't allow that to happen again. So it's an important program and one that we need your help. We don't have the resources to be out there looking at every Kratom vendor. Uh, and so if you see a Kratom vendor who you think is, is uh, making impermissible medical claims, we had one, believe it or not, we had one several months ago who put on their website that Kratom cured the coronavirus. Uh, you, you can't have that. You just can't have that if you want to protect the marketplace and, and also primarily to protect consumers. Uh, Dave and Mac, any additional thoughts before I go on to the next question on that? Well, just again, really, I think the, the most important part that we can all do is educate our 
representatives. And that's just so key because, you know, uh, Mac brought up the example in the state where they're told it's an opioid and people just believe it. And it's just amazing how sometimes you think there's this real sophistication that goes into lawmaking and you'd be surprised that a lot of times there's not. And that's why it's just so important that, and I think also, you know, the culture in the state houses is changing. Over the past decade, I've seen that there is a real consensus in terms of listening to the constituents that, you know, the, the influence of special influence and that is really diminishing. And so, more and more that they're listening to their constituents and that that's how they're getting their information and deciding what to pay attention to because that's the other thing i mean as a lawmaker you know you're drinking from a fire hose there's so many issues so many things you have to pay attention to that unless they're hearing from people in their community it's hard to pay attention to and that's what we really have to recognize so that's the real power we have and we have these amazing stories and amazing act activists that we really uh, just need to get out there and make sure they hear us. Absolutely, thank you for that. Uh, Mac, if you could uh, touch on this, I know you briefly touched on it earlier. What is the difference between a vendor making a health claim and a consumer making a health claim? The vendor goes to jail and the <laughs> consumer is allowed to do whatever they want. Yeah. You have the right as a citizen to express your view a First Amendment constitutionally protected right to a free speech to say whatever you want about the effect that a product has on your health and well-being. You can be wrong, by the way. You could you could be saying something that's completely ridiculous, but you're allowed to do it. The commercial speech restrictions imposed by the courts through well-established case law allow for the government to enforce the protection, the, the standards of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act for commercial speech. And the difference is that when you're engaged in commercial speech, you're trying to increase your bottom line revenues for a food product that you're offering for sale. And by making impermissible claims, you spike sales and you benefit economically from it. And so that's why the law is different. That's why a vendor cannot have a comment made on any platform they control, even though they didn't make the statement, it was a consumer. They're not, you have to strip those comments out if you're a vendor. If you are a consumer and you wanna come on the AK website, have at it. You can tell your personal story. We welcome it. You want to get on Facebook and to the extent that Facebook doesn't put you in jail for comments that they don't like, you can say it there. Uh, as a consumer, you have complete freedom. If you are a vendor and a consumer, you have to take the higher road, which is the vendor law, and you can't be engaged in having those discussions because you'll be in front of a judge explaining, well, that I was actually speaking as a citizen then rather than a vendor. They're not going to buy that. So if you're a pure consumer, say whatever you want, but do it in the appropriate forum uh, not by on a vendor website where you get them in trouble. Absolutely. Very good. Um, I had somebody write in and ask, is there anything that we can do about the misinformation that's listed on WebMD? Uh, if you want to touch a little bit of that, uh, about that, Mac. Here's the reason that WebMD, and by the way, they've moderated a little bit. Uh, it doesn't look like it, but they really have gotten better. WebMD has an agreement with the FDA where they share and disseminate information together. They have a formal written agreement. It is no surprise that WebMD parrots what the FDA says. That's true with Mayo Clinic, same thing. We went to Mayo Clinic and offered to do studies, pay for studies that they could do, and they said they wouldn't do it because of the FDA. So you just we need to understand the FDA is pervasive here. Uh, and they entered into these agreements where they can control the dissemination of information. And it's unfortunate that when you Google Kratom, you're going to get the WebMD statements and the uh, MedWatch and, and Mayo Clinic. And they are all wrong because it's just an FDA information loop. I'd encourage you to go on to our policy brief section and look up that policy brief on the FDA information loop. It is corrupt. It shouldn't be allowed to happen. And yet they do it because they're allowed to. I mean, they, they get away with it. And we, we ought to be restricting that. The truth ought to prevail. Absolutely. Uh, I'm getting a lot of folks who are asking individual questions about states. Are we going to be putting out some information here in the upcoming week or so about the status of uh, our efforts in various states? Stay tuned. By Monday, there'll be a, a legislative report. There's a lot happening in the states, and it's like swamping us. But we'll get a report out by Monday that will give you an update. And it'll be a dynamic report because some states are still at play. Uh, we're getting... We're getting a huge pushback from the, uh, the FDA. And unfortunately, 
from people in the Kratom community are being misled by this libertarian nonsense that we don't need any regulations. And there are some legislators that are responding to that. So we're, we're doing our best and we're, they're hurting us, by the way. Uh, but we're going to continue to fight here and you'll see a report by Monday. Okay, fantastic. Uh, what are Kratom uh, consumers, advocates supposed to do when they're faced with the situation of saying the board of pharmacy in their state is looking to, to ban Kratom? They're not elected officials. Uh, what, what do they need to do to try and get involved to help out when we're, when we're facing a board of pharmacy, say like in Nevada or in Ohio? So the good news and bad news here. The state of Ohio Board of Pharmacy did try to ban Kratom and we won that battle. There were hundreds of Kratom consumers who showed up at the public hearing and midway through the afternoon when they still had 120 left to testify, they waved the, the white flag. Uh, they, they dropped it. Now we're working now with various departments in Ohio. There is a, a very interesting version of the KCPA that is filed in Ohio, which is the product of negotiations with the Department of Food Safety at the Department of Agriculture, which we think is going to pass and it will protect Kratom. So that's a good thing. In the state of Arizona, the Board of Pharmacy tried to ban Kratom. And when we went and testified there, along with some vendors and consumers, uh, absolutely, they backed down. Uh, and in Nevada, they have formally opened a scheduling procedure that will take about two more years, uh, if we're lucky that we can stretch it out that long, uh, where they're going to try to ban it. And, and they're not favorable to us. They have the statutory authority granted by the legislature to designate Kratom as a Schedule One substance. Now, the good news is that they mirror the standards that are set by the federal government. And you would think that any state agency would say, well, if the feds, if it doesn't meet the criteria for the federal government, and we mirror that criteria, why would we schedule it? The Department of, of uh, the Board of Pharmacy staff, lawyer, told me arrogantly that didn't matter to him. He said, we ban things whether the feds do it or not. So we have a battle with the Board of Pharmacy in uh, the state of, state of Nevada because they are appointed people, but they have the statutory mandate and authority to schedule substances. So that's going to be a real battle for us going forward. We expect that the FDA will try to use other states to do the Board of Pharmacy uh, to do the same thing. So we're going to be resolute in our efforts to protect Kratom at that level. Absolutely. Uh, one person asked, and, and obviously this the focus of this uh, time of year is state legislators, uh, but they asked, what's the status of the federal KCPA and what are we thinking about the timeline once we get past all of the state legislatures? Uh, what's the timeline on that? The change in administrations upset our schedule for the filing of the federal KCPA. Uh, our champions in the Congress believe that the first thing we need to do is have a discussion with the new FDA nominee about Kratom to determine whether or not that individual is willing to go reset the agency's position on Kratom, which will dictate how we would frame the Kratom Consumer Protection Act at the federal level. Uh, and then of course, uh, other events have occurred when we learned about the withdrawal of the, of the uh, HHS recommendation for scheduling that eliminated the provision that we had in the Federal Kratom Consumer Protection Act. So. We're reframing the, the language and we are waiting for the FDA commissioner to have to give him a fair chance, that person a fair chance to have a discussion about whether they're willing to go out there and just tell the policy people at the FDA who hate Kratom. And by the way, it wasn't, I, I know we like to pick on Scott Gottlieb and he deserves it. Uh, Scott Got Gottlieb inherited a policy arm at the FDA that has had a long standing hatred of Kratom that goes back clear to the early 90s when they hated dietary supplements and all herbal products and tried to get them banned at the time anyway. And so this is a question of freedom. Uh, the same argument that occurred in the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act was about the freedom of consumers to make informed choices about products they use for their health and well-being. Today, more than 80% of the American public uses vitamins and dietary supplements to maintain their health and well-being. If the FDA had their choice, they would ban all of those products, force everything into the new drug application process. We know why that is, because it's all about the money. And so we need, at this point, to fight as hard as we can. And we're going to get that federal KCPA on the books if the new FDA commissioner is unwilling to bust up that cabal out there at the FDA that has led this battle against Kratom for decades. Absolutely. Uh, David, uh, I know you're working in, in Pennsylvania, you're working in Connecticut, you're working in New Jersey, you're working all over the place. What what do you what's one of the biggest challenges that you face when you go in and talk to legislators about Kratom? Is it that they 
don't know what it is? Is it, what, what are you experiencing when going in and talking to them? It's really simple. Um, it's really that lack of education. So, so we're coming in and literally I would tell you it's like 99% of the time they'll tell me that they never heard of Kratom until we reached out to them and, and scheduled the meeting. And so it takes that education. So the best thing is, of course, I'm trying like rapid fire to get as many meetings. And when I talk to the lawmakers, they're very receptive. Uh, most of the time, they're very receptive and very interested. Um, they, of course, have some questions. Um, you know, they've done some minimal research maybe before the meeting and, you know, they found the WebMD article or, you know, something else. So they've got questions about it. Um, and that's, that's the biggest obstacle. So that's why I know the nice thing is one of the great resources we have is the, the passionate consumers. And that's why that will speak volumes that yes, we can send them reports and white papers and that helps. But what really helps is that personal uh, conversation, that story being shared with them. So that's why we're trying to activate and um, get as many people to email lawmakers throughout you know, the states that I'm working in and, and all the states, because that really helps us. That as people know about it, as lawmakers are educated about it, it makes it so much easier. It makes it so much easier. Um, I think that is our really our biggest obstacle it's not that there's people really, you know, fighting it. It's just this lack of information and um, a lack of a motivation to take action. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, 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 I, I would add there are oh, yeah, two things that every consumer advocate should have ready to send to their legislators. The first is the HHS rescission letter. That letter, which was signed on August 16th of 2018, kept secret by the FDA by using the FOIA exemption for regulatory review until about six weeks ago, that letter completely dissembles the FDA's claims about Kratom, and it is critically important for a legislator to see it and highlight the fact that the Assistant Secretary for Health said in evaluating whether or not Kratom should be banned, that it put millions of Kratom consumers at significant public health risk because they would be forced into the opioids that are far more dangerous and deadly than Kratom. You will increase deaths. He said it clearly and plainly. Now, we're not against opioids. Opioids are an important tool for, for physicians to have available for them in the fight against uh, acute and chronic pain. But when you look at which products should be used, then that's an important thing. The second thing you need to have is the John Hopkins study and in, infographic is easier. That study looked at adult Kratom consumers and examined for those that are using it for acute and chronic pain management that 87% reported that it had a significant reduction in their withdrawal symptoms. And here's the great kicker, 35% were opioid free within a year. If we're looking at harm reduction, if we're looking at the science that documents that Kratom is, the, the, the reason that people say it saved my life is because of that kind of data share that data with those legislators, those two documents will blow the FDA away because it attacks the very argument the FDA makes. It proves the FDA is wrong. We don't have to be the ones to say it. It is the Assistant Secretary for Health, which is an independent arbiter of the facts of the science and the safety profile of Kratom. And that letter takes them apart. And think about this. If you are the, the uh, CEO of a pharma company that, that produces pain management products, and you saw the Johns Hopkins study that said that Kratom is safer than the products that you are marketing, that people are able to manage their acute and chronic pain without the debilitating side effects of those medications, without putting themselves at risk. What would you think as the farm executive? You'd say, my God, I'm going to lose my market to this plant. And so is it any wonder why they have recruited all of their allies at the FDA in order to fight against this miracle plant. We just have to understand what we're up against and continue to diligently fight against it. And legislators get this, by the way. They understand there's an economic incentive for pharma to try to block any kind of product that would compete against them, particularly if it doesn't cost consumers and it doesn't have to go through the FDA's uh, new drug application process, which by the way, the FDA makes money on too. Uh, and under the, uh, the current regimen for evaluation of new drug applications, Pharma requires that a new drug applicant pay them three and a half billion dollars up front uh, in order to get it evaluated. I'm sorry, it, it, it's 3.5 million, and then they have to pay 
a t the total cost of it over a 10 year period is 3.5 to $5 billion. There's a lot of money, S more than 65% of the revenue, uh, the, the budgets of FDA's CEDAR division, which is a center for drug evaluation and research comes from user fees that are paid by applicants. And before the PDUFA Act passed, the Prescri Prescription Drug User Fee Act, it was, it was about, uh, well, zero. And then it went to 9% within two years and now it's up over 65%. That tells you where the misalignment of the financial incentives that, that regard good public health policy with respect to Kratom, we're being undermined by the money. And that's something that we just simply have to, uh, to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Mac on this, on this call, Mac has been talking about the letters, been talking about other studies. If you haven't been to our website in a while, please go to our website. We update it with the latest information. We have links to all the studies that Mac's referring to. We've got, got a link to the HHS letter. Uh, we, we try to put as much information possible for you to access up on the website. You can also go to the website and join our forum. Uh, our online discussion forum allows you to talk to other Kratom uh, advocates and hear what's going on uh, around the country. Mac there and, and David, there was a question. I think this may be a good question to start wrapping things up. If there are any final questions, you can uh, go to the Q&A hit that, or after we end, if you want to contact me, pete.canlan at americankratom.org, uh, I'll make sure that we get an answer to your question. But Nate asks, I think this might be a good one to wrap up on, how is the overall outlook on keeping Kratom legal in the country looking more positive or negative than a few years ago? I'll jump in and I'll say that I feel very positive about it. I mean, of course, I'm in the Northeast where we're moving on things like recreational marijuana, where, you know, totally different in terms of taking an illegal substance and making it legal. You know, we're talking about keeping this legal substance, but at least the attitude is one where to ban a product that people are getting value from is just not in the wheelhouse, at least in the states where we're um, focused in. Um, I know that's not true across the country, but I feel that there's this narrative that people understand that to just have an outright ban is something that is destructive and doesn't work. So I feel positive about it, especially with the backing of the rescission letter. And hopefully everyone can get access to that and see that. But ultimately, you know, the, the words of wisdom I want to leave you with are very simple. It's that your voice really matters, that your advocacy matters. And that's really what we need on the ground level for you to, it doesn't have to be complicated. Pick up the phone, call your lawmaker, make sure your lawmaker knows who you are. And that will be the greatest asset that we can have in this battle to keep Kratom accessible. And, and I would echo that. I think that, uh, that we see real progress that's being made. And, and you know, back in, in 2016, we were dead in the water and we shoved it to the FDA because they were wrong. And we've proven time and time again that they're wrong. And now we he we're here at a crossroads in many respects where it comes to what the Kratom community is going to do. And what David just described where we have this vigilant community that's out there telling their legislators how important it is and how valuable Kratom has been in their lives. That's fabulous. I read something on Reddit today that kind of blew me away. And there aren't many things that surprise me anymore about the Kratom community. But there was a, a woman who related the fact that her husband had gone to the VA hospital in the state of Virginia and that he disclosed to his VA doctor that he was taking Kratom to help manage some of the service-related injury pain issues that he was suffering from. And the doctor said, I've heard more and more veterans come in and tell me the same thing. I encourage you to continue to use it. Now that is a fabulous outcome that is derivative of the efforts of the Kratom community to socialize the value of Kratom when you talk to your doctors, when you talk to your legislators, when you talk to policymakers and be able to relate the positive experiences that you've had, it is the pathway for success. Dr. Jack Henningfield can lay down the marker about the science that relates to Kratom. I can talk about the policy of Kratom and talk about the relative merits of one policy over another as David does, but it is the individual Kratom consumer whose experience moves people, moves these legislators, because you can tell them how it's impacted you. I have heard hundreds and hundreds of Kratom consumers tell their heartfelt stories. They matter. 
I know people get, you know, you're afraid to stand up there and say it. You, you stand in front of that microphone and you're, you, know, you see in front of you this array of these legislators and it's daunting and it's intimidating. And yet when they tell their story, it, it moves the needle for the Kratom community. So I, I thank every one of you that have the courage to do it. Those that continue to support us uh, obviously, this is this is a very expensive operation that we are undertaking in about 30 states right now. We're not going to win this year in all of those states, but we are setting the foundation for get winning next year. We have we have I think around eight states that have committed to what they call interim committee hearings already, where it's not going to be about banning kratom. It's going to be about how do we get to the kratom consumer protection act because the bans are passe. We've beaten every ban, and there have been, have been 19 of them since 2016, promoted by the FDA in the states, and we won on every one of those bans. Now, the FDA, as everyone knows, is turning to the local communities, and we're fighting those as best we can, but we're going to win at the state level, continue to win, and when we get uh, within the next two years, we're going to have over 30 states that have passed the Creative Consumer Protection Act, and then game over for the FDA, uh, unless they come to their senses beforehand, which we hope will happen. So thanks to everyone for the, the dedicated efforts you make, for your voices, uh, for your, for your the, the, the passion you bring to it, because that's what makes all the difference. And we're grateful for every one of you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mac. And, and I just would just echo um, uh, Mac's sentiment on, on I appreciate everyone uh, and the support you give to the American Kratom Association. Uh, folks have been asking, well, are we going to be in this state or we plan on doing commercials? Uh, a lot of what we do is driven by the resources that, that you all give us. And, and as I've seen on the front line, if somebody asked, am I more positive and, or, or negative about the future? Uh, I, am, I am positive, I, absolutely more positive uh, because I've seen when we have the resources, when Mac and David have the resources that we're able to hire the lobbyists to assist them in what they were doing, when we're able to get the truth out about Kratom, we win. And we're unfortunately we're facing a, an opponent in the FDA who uh, is backed by the federal government that can literally print their own money. Uh, and so that's why we rely on you. That's why we we hat in hand. We we ask each month for your assistance. Uh, we don't do that lightly. We understand, especially during this time, that people are are recovering from a, a brutal hit that that many folks took. Uh, but it is only through your generosity that we were able to keep this fight going. We're very appreciative of it. Uh, we're going to continue to ask for your support because, uh, again, we know that if we have the resources, if we have all of you who are willing to email, to call, uh, to, to share your Kratom stories, we will win every single time. And that's our hope and that's our commitment to you. Uh, David, any final thoughts uh, before we end the call? It's just an honor to be with all of you and thank you for the work that all of you are doing that are on this call and beyond. You know, as a lawmaker, I got involved in this years ago and my, I was one of those lawmakers, heard the FDA, heard these different things and came into it very confused, but it was the education I received, not from lobbyists, not from any groups. It was the individuals in and around my community that really educated me as this lawmaker. And I was fortunate because I had put in legislation regarding Kratom. And so I got that attention, and, but we need to be proactive. And, th and that's really the, the bottom line. So look forward to working with each of you. And I know we will be successful. Thank you, David. And thank you for all that you do. And, and Mac, we want to thank you for, uh, you're putting a lot of frequent flyer miles out there. You're traveling all over the country. You're speaking uh, to a lot of legislators. You're, I, I think, one of our, our best advocates out there. Uh, thank you, Mac, for all that you do. Any final thoughts or words, Mac, before we end the call tonight? No, I've said enough. Uh, thank you to everybody for all the help. And David, thank you again, once again for joining this great team. You, you, you're a real asset to us, and we look forward to expanding that relationship. Thank you, Mac. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for being on the call. We have recorded this. We will send out a recording. Please share the recording with others. Please share it on social media. Uh, we we want to do everything we can to get the truth out about Kratom. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening.